Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, a sweet new Bowie from Spain, Serge Panchenko has a big one on the way, and 10 amazing daggers. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment from this past week, a lot of good comments, uh, but my favorite was uh, as I was commenting on how the large 3V cold steel knives are hugely expensive and uh, just me says... Uh, 100 bucks for materials, 50 bucks in belts, insane energy prices for insane heat treatment. Yeah, 500 bucks for a giant 3V blade sounds about right. And then he added to his comment, not to mention overhead and labor. This is where the small time makers actually have an advantage. Support local guys. It's the future. So I couldn't agree more. First of all, uh, on the first point, yes, I, I I was not taking into account some of these things like actually working 3V steel in a factory environment and how expensive that might get. Uh, but you would imagine doing it on scale, it's going to get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, so I, my my outrage still, still holds. Uh, but his second point, even better, uh, just in looking here uh, on the knife cam. Here's an example of a quote unquote local maker. This is Matt Chase from Massachusetts, Hogtooth Knives. You can get a knife from him, uh, outrageously complicated uh, with, with Damascus steel, a complicated uh, build, expensive materials, expensive processes for a lot of money, or get something totally practical and uh, you that you're going to be carrying and using every day, like this Tonto, for way, way less. And most makers offer this kind of range. So uh, when when thinking about buying knives, and, and so may, you might have to start with fixed blades because... Uh, they tend to be less expensive on the custom end. So take a look at some of your local makers. Take a look at some of the, the makers right here in the United States who are making small batches of knives or, or one-off knives and see what you can find. So uh, thanks again for watching and commenting, just me and everyone else. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, now, what do you say we go to a pocket check? Today, I had a classic on me. Now, I'm going through two different uh, kind of knife jags or tears, if you want, right now. I'm going through a Bowie knife thing, and I'm going through a dagger thing. Two huge, you know, emblematic blade styles and, and knife types. And I happen to be going through a phase for both of them at the same time. So <clears throat> today, I was definitely just looking at it now. I mean, I did not intend for this, but I went very clip point heavy today, uh, very Bowie inspired today. Uh, in my right pocket, I had the most awesome, probably uh, my favorite Emerson design of all time, the CQC 13. It is a perfect Bowie blade. And uh, I am saying Bowie, I'm a Yank. I grew up in Ohio. It's Bowie to me. Uh, but I, uh, I have respect for all pronunciations like Bowie and Bowie. Uh, no, I'm just saying, uh, Bowie. Uh, but uh, this is my favorite of his clip point blades, and Ernest Emerson has a scat of them. He loves clip point blades, and he's designed a lot of them. Paired them up with different handles, <clears throat> and uh, that uh, that sort of thing. But this, I believe, was his very second uh, clip point uh, in the production world. I think his first one was the uh, much sought after. CQC something or other, uh, based on the AK-47 bayonet, uh, which is a frame lock, I believe, one of the first titanium frame lock he did, uh, or at least in a, in a production setting. This handle is one that has been passed down to other um, blades. I'm thinking of the Tiger right now. It is such an awesome handle. It just, it, it really defines, it is, it is the epitome of Emerson ergonomics nestles in the hand perfectly bookends you perfectly i have medium-sized hands if you have big giant mitts you can get in there there's space in there for you too um what a great feeling knife and uh the one thing that uh my buddy ian who who teaches me knife stuff and uh knows a lot more about this stuff uh 
practically speaking than I, always kind of gripes about the wave. He's like, I love that you can pull it out and it waves open, but I hate that you can't put your thumb there. And yeah, on some models, you can actually on the Tiger, you it, it, the blade is low slung and you can kind of get over it. This one, not so much. So I, I hear that. Uh, I do hear that criticism, but you know, I can't level it against this. If you're wondering uh, why this knife is so handsomely accoutred, uh, I will tell you these are scales by Vantage Point, uh, Vantage Point uh, Blade Works, and he makes awesome scales. That's Tom Engelson. He used to go uh, as blades and such, but he he sort of formalized his his business more. And man, he does amazing stuff. Uh, Emerson's all day long, and then I've seen him do ZTs, and then I just saw him make a carbon fiber front uh, show scale for a Les George VSEP. So he's just doing amazing work. And the funny thing is, is when you get your knife back from him, I have a uh, an Elvia wearing scales from him. You get it back and, you're, and your Emerson has never performed as well. You know, it, he in taking it apart and putting it back to, together, he really kind of refines the action. So uh, uh, hats off to him. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, next up. A new one, the new one from Jack Wolf Knives. It's the Benny's Clip. His take, him, him being Ben Belkin. I'm sure you've heard the name by now, uh, but Ben Belkin's take on the Lanny's Clip. This is an awesome knife. Every every one, all six of them uh, that I've had, that I have and use, I carry these things all the time. Uh, he definitely uh, resurrected my uh, interest in slip joints, which, as you know, if you've been watching here, has, is deep and storied. I have a lot of slip joints and I love them, but I hadn't carried them in about a year. And then these started coming out and uh, I'm hooked again. But it it, it seems like with uh, only a few variations, it's all Jack Wolf uh, in my front left pocket these days. <clears throat> uh, they're hard use, fine knives, work knives. They're, they're like, uh, let me say, what do I want to say? They're field grade. That's what we say in the knife world. They're field grade slip joints, but so refined, so beautiful. Everything about them is really well made, hand finished, um, perfectly fit uh, with a great action, um, fully flat, uh, fully hollow ground blades on all of them. But this one, because traditionally the Lanny's clip does not have a full flat grind at all. So you, to get that swedge and to get it just right. Uh, it's like this, but super thin behind the edge, incredibly cutty. This is uh, every time I get one, I'm like, I've used this one more than any other. And I think I've been saying that just because um, I I carry it and it's the freshest in my mind. But I do feel like I've pulled this out for more than any other. Uh, I used this as a steak knife uh, this past weekend when we went out to dinner. And uh, I got to say, uh, I, well, I'm always in the mood for steak. Uh, but this knife in my pocket is what what clinched the deal. That's how much of a nerd I am. I was like, I, I have to cut my steak with the Benny's clip tonight. So I have to get a steak. You know, even if I feel like salmon, it's got to be a, a steak. Because, you know, it would be goofy to pull this out to cut salmon when you can just flake it apart with your fork. Benny's clip. It's going on sale uh, on Friday. So, man, get on it. This one is going to absolutely fly. And I've seen... Um, I've seen the carbon fiber editions, and I believe there are two different ones, the green and the purple. Man, just beautiful. <clears throat> and you know I don't say that often about carbon fiber. And actually, you're saying, Bob, you're saying that an awful lot lately, actually. And it's true, because carbon fiber has gone beyond basket weave. Uh, so uh, I've been digging it a lot more. Uh, on my hip, uh, one that is, man, uh, I'm thinking I got to circle back and get another one from Eric Kramer, because... Uh, Eric Kramer Custom Knives Voodoo is my uh, is in is tied with the Hog Tooth Knives Tonto for most carried uh, EDC fixed blade because it is just so easy to carry. It's light, it's very thin, uh, it's got a great sheath. Uh, that's another thing that it has in common with Hog Tooth. It also comes with the uh, uh, discrete concepts clip, and look at this thing. He calls it a Persian. I call it a clip point. Upswept, I had him double edge it. And uh, man, this thing is, it, it's its a great knife. It is a great knife. I have not used this much for EDC like I uh, like I have used the, the Hog Tooth Tonto. I have no doubt it would be uh, very good and capable, but it is 
hollow ground and thin, and it does have a tip for thrusting. And I did have him double edge it, so that makes it even more. Mm, I don't want to necessarily call it delicate, but uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to risk this one as much uh, on EDC tasks. But uh, I've no doubt it would be fine. One fifty four cm and very slicey. So uh, ah, I love this thing. He does uh, a, a number of different. Uh, thin fixed blades that are easy to carry. The next one I get from him will be a double-edged dagger Grinch. And yes, that's because I'm saying that because I'm in this dagger uh, thing right now. Who knows? Maybe by the time I get to buy another Kramer custom knife, I'll be back in a Pakal stage. He has a cool one of those too. Uh, for emotional support today, I had the, the most awesome Pinkerton designed uh, asymmetrical um, contact this thing is awesome i love it this is this is the epitome of dirk pinkerton design and i i i think he's nailed all sorts of um, magical ratios here uh if you look at the edge straight uh as if it's on the surface it's cutting on you've got a really great sweep up from the handle a uh, nice arch on the spine of the handle nestles uh, right behind the thumb muscle and it fits in the palm perfectly the ergonomics are Look at that. That's a straight line down here. Two straight lines up here, but it melts in the hand. And then you have this perfect Warncliffe blade. It's a perfect Warncliffe blade with that perfect angled point there. Uh, <laughs> I keep forgetting to get out a protractor. I don't know, know if I have one, but I, I keep forgetting to measure the actual angle of this because I've been talking about how it has the same angle as the Warncliffe on the Hinderer XM series and how beautiful that one is, looks and performs. And I think there's something golden about that Warncliffe tip angle. Uh, but this asymmetrical by Beyond EDC is just nice and light, titanium, uh, titanium, great action, really nice pocket clip, works great, also looks very good. A um, lot of micro milling as uh, Pinkerton likes to put in his stuff. Uh, around the the chamfering here, uh, regular style jimping, uh, but you do see the Pinkerton style uh, half cup jimping on the sides of the titanium here. Uh, this is on loan from Dirk. I'm going to do a video on it uh, post haste and 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 either get this back to him or offer to buy it from him because I I dig it and it's in my hand. It's convenient just to say, hey, can I uh, send you some money for it instead of sending it back and then buying one. Uh, actually, I don't even know if they're currently available. I do have to check. Uh, okay, so that's what I had on me today. I had the Emerson CQC 13, the Jack Wolf Knives Benny's Clip, the Kramer Custom Knives, uh, that's Eric Kramer, by the way, uh, Voodoo, double-edged, and the um, uh, Contact by uh, <laughs> by Asymmetrical. I just stabbed myself. That's why I'm stammering. Stabbed myself trying to resheath this knife trying to put it in the wrong sheath that's uh that's doing too many too many things at once but i will have you know that the hogtooth knives knife is quite sharp so now if you saw the uh video i did on which one was it i think it was the uh canine jack uh, i cut myself on that one pretty good and just bled all over the thing but i was i was about seven minutes into the video i didn't want to cut and redo the video so i just kind of went with it but uh it was a bloody mess. All right. Uh, coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at some uh, new knives in uh, Knife Life News, and uh, and then we'll go to the state of the collection. Uh, but before we go there, uh, if you're interested in supporting the show and you want to check out the different tiers of support and the different uh, exclusive content, knife giveaways, that kind of thing that you can check out, uh, just go to Patreon. You can uh, click the cute, not click, but... Uh, Take a picture of the QR code. It'll take scan the QR code. It'll take you right there. Or you can go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Pe people are telling me that I'm getting out of touch with technology. Uh, I think I got to get the words right. Scan the QR code or go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. If you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife. And we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit the knifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives.
You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. I feel like this is a story we do almost on a weekly basis, but Savivi has two new knives coming out. Uh, let me tell you why Why this time it's actually exciting to me. Now, that didn't sound right. It's always cool, but but Savivi, uh, you know, we have no, has no problem with output and their designs are frequently predictable. But here we have two new knives that are both large, which I love, and both um, uh, affordable, which I love, and they look different than the usual sort of uh, Elementum style of Civivi knife. So first one here is a pretty classy looking looking affair. And, and the blade itself reminds me a lot of the new XL uh, bag lighter uh, by Kaiser spear point with a with a swedge that goes about a quarter of the way up the blade there very handsome looking blade in, in a in a very handsome looking handle there you got speed holes which ordinarily do not do it for me but here i do not mind them uh in the uh, canvas micarta background and then you've got a bolster there it's a flipper it's a nice looking knife i gotta say um nitro v is the steel you know that full front, uh, full flat ground blade will be nice and slicey. It's from Sabivi. Uh, I like this. It's sort of gentlemanly and uh, at at uh, three point seven five uh, inches in blade length. It's a it's a nice size or three point seven, I should say. But the one that is really interesting to me is the more you know Bowie style <laughs> or more aggressive style one here, uh, the Cynesis. I think that's what it's called, the Synesis. Uh, sin is sis. Yes, that's what it is. S i n i s y s. <clears throat> it's a Bowie, and uh, it's got a slight harpoon on that swedge, and uh, just a nice three point seven five inch blade. Uh, finger choil, which acts as an awesome uh, sharpening choil. There, uh, in the example we see here on Knife News, it's got the burlap micarta, which I'm always a fan of, uh, not only in, in looks but in feel. And, uh, you know, I just like the look of it. it it's it got a much, uh, this reminds me of a Sen cut. One of the first Sen cuts that came out had a similar blade to this, but it just looks different. And the uh, way it looks different for Civivi and the way in which it looks different veers in my uh, aesthetic direction. So very happy about that. Um, so <laughs> I am looking forward to this 3.75 inches. Sounds like sounds like someone's trying to get in here. Um, okay. Well, we'll put that one down and see if it comes out or see if when it comes out, I get it. But that's uh, on the way. Here's one that if it comes or when it comes out, I should probably get this because it's so beautiful. And I've always had this excuse not to get this uh, this designer and this maker's knives because they tend to be very small. Uh, but in this case, the Serge Panchenko, uh, uh, what, are, what are they calling this? What is he calling this? This 3.75 inch uh, uh, cleaver-ish, cleaver-esque blade. Oh, the trisect is just, oh my God, it is a gorgeous looking thing here. Uh, it's beautifully shaped blade is cleaver-esque. It's got an awesome looking swedge and a big giant sharpening choil. Uh, under a lozenge shape opening hole. Uh, everything about this knife is is beautiful to me. It looks futuristic. It looks tactical. It looks classy with the inlay material. And uh, and it's all Serge Pachenko all day long. Uh, looks like you might be able to front flip it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I, it, it, that's exactly what Ben Schwartz says. Looks like you might be able to front flip it. But I would say it depends a lot on how you jimp the blade or how you jimp the um the front flipper there so very beautiful knife uh exciting to see serge panchenko come out with uh something large i think his aesthetic deserves it uh but uh, it sounds corny but i do believe it and i i believe that for being such a, a good person i deserve it so uh maybe that is in the offing for me uh but if you want to get good deals on knives uh check out our knife ship free link just go to the knife and knife ship free man we get these emails from them every week with just these drool worthy knives with uh at, at awesome offers does that awesome offers 
And uh, so always exciting. Go check that out. Uh, still come uh, coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast. We're going to take a look at uh, new knives in my collection and then 10 great daggers. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I'm on a bit of a dagger tear. And uh, what does that mean? Well, that that just means that uh, I, my wandering eye has settled on daggers right now. Daggers and bowies. I know, I know. Uh, but for the sake of this conversation right now, it's uh, we're talking about the daggers. And uh, I was getting some work pants on Amazon. And uh, wouldn't you know, this was in my cart and it and it hopped over in from the wish list into the cart and it's the uh it was only, it was only 28 bucks uh it's the uh, what are they even calling this thing again the counter tack 2 sorry the cold steel names they all sound very very alike uh the counter tack 2 this is a dagger that has a really awesome chisel grind so look at that those very steep bevels uh on this 3 inch dagger very small knife. And then you flip it over. It's got this spooned out flat side. Um, just a wicked knife. You can totally slash and cut with this. Totally. You can cut and slash with this, but this is a thruster. This thing is uh, puts a triangular hole in, in that in, into whatever you're pushing it into. Um, if you can, I'm trying to get close in on the tip so you can see it is a, an, uh, it's like a pyramid. Very, very uh, nice knife. Very light, very small, as I mentioned. It is a, I can get four fingers on it. Lynn Thompson can get four fingers on it. Uh, but it's a, it's a tight fit, for sure. But, but that's the whole point. If you have this thing gripped in reverse grip like this, and you just have a fist, first of all, it, the, the handle is slender enough and uh, contoured enough that you can actually use it as a fist load and punch effectively with this. I generally don't like punching uh, with things in my hands. Um, I prefer to punch empty fisted. That's what I'm used to. That's what I'm used to. I don't want to jack up my knuckles because, but this right here in, in the hand, first of all, it's soft and it's contoured and I can grip it and make a fist solid enough to punch with it and still have it in my hand. And to me, that's a, that's a, that's a good benefit to have in something you're going to carry around your neck, or it also has a belt sheath and carries very nicely on the belt. It just, it's just hard to hide um, because it's, it's set up to sit on the top of your belt. And if you put it on the inside of your belt, it's a little too grippy on the shirt and on the love handles, you know, uh, but around the neck, it is super, super light. Um, and yeah, like I said, just really excellent. Oh, and in forward grip, uh, the handle is small enough that that rounded uh, pommel nestles, butts up against your palm here. So you get uh, really good force behind that thrust. Super sharp tip. You can also do it sideways like this in a sort of shovel grip. That's what I call it. I'm, that's what I'm calling it from now on. It's a shovel grip. Uh, and uh, you, yeah, so you can hold it like that. And you have these side guards to push your thumb up against. Just a really, really awesome little dagger uh, for 28 bucks. It's Aus 8 steel. It is the neck knife that I always see Lynn Thompson uh, carrying around his neck in, in all the most recent Deadliest Weapon videos. Uh, so I, I make fun of it, but I love those videos. I love when they come out. So uh, Counterattack 2, check it out. The Counterattack 1 is a 5-inch version of this, uh, more of a you know boot knife. Uh, this is sort of a boot knife uh, form factor here. And uh, and the so the Counterattack 1 is a bigger version of this. I had that at one point, and then I don't know what I did with it. I sold it, gave it away. Something happened to it. Um, I didn't lose it. I know which knives I lose. It's always a heartache. Okay, so going from my dagger fascination uh, to my, uh, you know, my recent dagger phase to my recent and current Bowie phase. Got to check this one out. This is a knife that I was made aware of uh, by Legion Tactical. Uh, I love his channel. I just started uh, following him not too long ago. I, I think he's only been around a year or two, um, but he we've got some similar uh, taste in knives, big burly fixed blades, and he got this one recently. It's a Kudaman uh, Bowie knife from Spain, and I I do not have any knives from Spain, but I do remember 
uh, in my high school days getting catalogs and uh, with knives from Spain and wanting like Ators and um, I remember Kudaman and what was the other brand? Uh, where was Jungly from? I, th I think they were Japanese, uh, but there was another um, Spanish brand that I that I really admired. But look at this thing. This is a wicked, wickedly sharp, hollow ground, sort of classic looking Bowie with the straight handle. Uh, reminds me a lot of the handle on my Von Temsky Bowie. Um, just a big stick, basically. This is what the human body is optimized to grab. The human hand is optimized to grab onto something like this, you know, a stick. And we like to put ergonomic flares on to make it fit even, even more securely and stuff. But but really, in essence, all we need is a stick. And this is my carta here. So if your hands get sweaty or, uh, you know, uh, bloody or oily or whatever it is, maybe not oil, but you're going to get as much grip off of this surface as you would anything or more grip off of this surface because, you know, my carta gets grippier when wet. So this is a, a molybdenum molybdenum <laughs> vanadium steel that's what they call it made in spain kudaman jbk i'm not sure what the j is but uh bowie knife is uh, what i'm saying the bk is dash one uh nice steel guard i gotta say the steel guard is a little could could handle a little chamfering i might just take a, a piece of sand paper and lightly go around both sides of it uh would only take a couple of passes just to knock off the edge there's a little edge on it um, very, very deeply hollow ground, uh, and it's just it, it, incredibly sharp, incredibly sharp. And what I really like about this knife is that I don't have to abuse this and beat this up to know it is a real, real hell of a woods knife. And how do I know that? I know that because uh, Legion Tactical took his out and abused it and pounded on it and did all sorts of chopping with it and all sorts of point you know point stabbing and putting it in in wood and all sorts of stuff and uh after about a half hour of uh, testing it and abusing it not not horribly or anything like that it was cutting paper slicing paper beautifully so this is a really nicely well-made knife i guess this this molybdenum vanadium steel is very well heat treated um because it, and the grind is awesome. It just, it works like a charm. So I have only cut paper with mine, but I'm looking forward to taking it out this coming weekend in the backyard and just noodling around with it. See how it does with the vines. See how the Virginia creeper does. Uh, this sheath I want to point out is beautiful. It's a nice, uh, sturdy, stout bow. Um, bow I just can't stop saying the word. Uh, leather sheath, beautiful red stitching. And then you've got this, uh, their their elephant logo engraved on there just a beautiful beautiful bowie knife uh i got this from chicago knife works and it was the lowest price i found anywhere uh, that was also a recommendation from legion tactical uh, to go there because i got a screaming deal on it as i did get a screaming deal on this next one uh the last knife here in the state of the collection and now we veer back into my uh dagger fascination and this one Man, I had to get this one right away. This is brand new from Topps Knives. This is the Express by Lacey Zabo. I am a big fan of Lacey Zabo knives, uh, his designs. And um, in the, I feel like in the late 90s, early 2000s, he was on my radar. Um, and I would go to his, he had a website with all these crazy designs. Uh, that were made he had certain makers make them or he made them himself and all just really um very tactical very self defensey uh, very ergonomic and um purpose driven this kind of thing uh so this is his new one with tops uh he has another one which I'll show you in a minute but it's the express and it's a dagger but it's a different kind of dagger it's a dagger with an asymmetrical handle and uh, it also comes with uh, a, you can get this single, single edged. And now I hold it like this and you look at the blade and it's actually a little bit more of a fighter. Uh, if you look at the blade, it looks a little bit more like a clip point, even though there isn't a clip, uh, but it has a shape that is not symmetrical. It is not exactly dagger shaped. 
So maybe maybe this shouldn't be in the upcoming list, but I gleefully put it in there uh, because in essence, in effect, it is a dagger. Um, you've got both sides sharp, uh, both with a belly and um, and the primary cutting edge seems to have almost a recurve, uh, a, a little bit of an angle down. And that will just, of course, aid in the slashing power of this. Um, you've got that medial ridge that flattens out uh, towards the Ricasso. You just got a really, really sharp top edge. And uh, and then as you work back towards the handle of this uh, 1095, it's a coated 1095 uh, blade steel here. You've got this tremendous uh, thumb ramp here. You are not going to be sliding up onto this uh onto this blade that's just not going to happen uh especially in this saber grip like this of course you cannot do the filipino grip on this knife uh with the thumb up on the spine you will you will slice yourself and if you get the single edged one it will not be comfortable either because the swedge comes to a very thin but flat edge uh new for lacy zabo or un unusual for lacy zabo designs is this somewhat neutral handle you have this arcing dorsal side and then a sort of flat gently arcing top you've got a uh, attitude adjuster here on the pommel uh, point there which is just comfortable enough to cap uh, you probably don't even need to if you grip it hard enough you've got really awesome um, texturing on these uh, micarta scales here and it's nice and thin but grippy and you've got that those red liners this thing is class all day long made in idaho uh, USA and designed by Lacey Zabo. If the name sounds familiar, let me show you real quick what he, uh, his uh, other design here that I have. This is the Felony Stop, also made by Tops, also designed by Lacey Zabo. Uh, this was also about to go in the dagger. This might be even more of a dagger than the Express when looking at it. It's a little more even from top to bottom, but it's bayonet ground, so I didn't put it in the in the upcoming list. Uh, but a great knife, self defense and just melts in the hand. Um, this uh, this very unique profile here. So very excited to get the new Tops Express. I knew as soon as it was announced, uh, it had to be mine. I had to make it mine. And uh, it's a great coincidence that it comes during this, uh, this time of dagger love uh, here in the Knife Junkie uh, den. Okay, I'm going to set this aside and... I am going to move on to 10 great daggers. Let's talk about these 10 great daggers. Spoken about a few of them. Um, here, let me just show you before we get into this. This is a trainer. Uh, this is a trainer by Cold Steel, and it's based on their, um, this is this is a trainer for their Safekeeper 1, uh, It's a, which is now out of print, uh, but you can still get the trainer for it. Um, this is one of the trainers I use. Uh, solo, uh, just when I'm just noodling around at home and I really feel like swinging a dagger around and I'm not sure uh, where the girls are or where the dog is and just don't want to be, you know, doing something dumb. This is a great thing to get. Um, you can get trainers in all different configurations and from a bunch of different companies, but <clears throat> I figured I'd just show this as we move into the uh, this conversation about daggers because uh, they are dangerous and they, they are double-edged and so sometimes uh, you might not be used to that, so it might be a good idea to get something like this, just if you feel like swinging it around. All right, so the first one here is the Cold Steel Taipan. I showed this off last week, and I've been wanting this for so long, and uh, finally, finally got it. A really great dagger in that it is a jack-of-all-trades. Uh, you have two, well, I should say four, uh, hollow ground bevels that that lead to very thin and sharp edges and down the center line you have a nice medial ridge where they all meet and then you have a nice sharp point uh, but the belly on these edges is part of the the selling point of this is because you can slash with this just as well as you can thrust and that is not always the case with daggers daggers as we know are point oriented they're thrust oriented they're generally stabbing weapons. Uh, but Lynn Thompson here, never wanting to be out uh, under-knived, uh, designed this thing 
to cut both ways and to be great on a thrust. So the Taipan is the world's deadliest snake, apparently. And this is, you can see the San Mai lines. This is VG10 San Mai. So I think that's 420 steel jacketing uh, VG10. Just beautiful knife. Uh, feels great in the hand with that Kraton. That's a big, generous five inch handle. You have an attitude adjuster here. Uh, and then a nice big guard, like a Suba almost. So it's round, it goes all the way around. And even if you have this in a sort of shovel grip, you have something to push your thumb up against. Uh, as all of the cold steel knives, it comes in an awesome Cray X sheath, used to, or Secure X sheath. They used to come in leather. Uh, that would have been cool. I missed the leather days. Cold Steel did some awesome leather sheaths. But practically speaking, and I'm sure in terms of expense uh, on the manufacturing side, uh, it's 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 all about the moldable plastics. Okay, next is the Columbia River Knife and Tool Stinger. This at one time was a bathroom knife. I have since uh, rotated it out because it's 1075 steel. And even though it's coated on the edge, it would always rust. And I was like, all right, I'm done cleaning this up. Uh, moved something else into the bathroom and uh, have put this in back in the, the drawer. But here, this comes with a bunch of different ways to attach it to your body. I remember it came with straps. So you could like strap it to your arm, which, uh, or your leg, which, you know, it's just kind of corny. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's some use for that. Uh, but it comes in a, also in a uh, plastic molded sheath. This one surrounded by nylon. And this is an A.J. Russell design. A.J. Russell, he died, I think, about a year ago now. But he was a, class, a, um, a stalwart in the knife world and uh, knife design. And this is one of his most famous uh, designs. The Stinger, his had bolsters and a wooden handle, and you know he had a bunch of different dressed up versions of this. Uh, CRKT licensed the design. It's a nice sharp dagger, very small. Uh, I have this cord on it because if I were to actually use this, uh, I would not want to slide up onto that blade. And there's just not enough there to ensure that I wouldn't. So to do this stops the blade. Um, I always thought that this sheath might be a little, uh, I don't know, insufficient. But I had a buddy at a place uh, I did Krav Maga for a little while. He used to carry this on his belt upside down and ride a motorcycle. And he said he never had problems with it. So uh, it put a little faith, put a little more faith in this sheath uh, than I had before. Um, here is an example. Now, these, these uh, bevels here are just slightly hollow ground. You can feel it. Um, and it's pretty, the edges are pretty sharp and I've stropped them to about as sharp as you, as they're going to go. But this is something that, uh, is primarily a thrusting tool, um, for sure. So you set it up in such a way that it fits in the palm of your hand and you have that nice pinch there. So without this cord, you could still make it work, um, in the hand just by the, by dint of the fact that the handle is short and it can butt up into the palm. All right, so that's the CRKT Sting. Sting, just like Frodo. No, not Frodo. Bilbo's Sword. Okay, uh, this one, as you just saw, uh, definitely makes the list. I'm very happy about this. I carried this all weekend long, including to Ikea. Uh, I carried this under my shirt and just kind of forgot about it. It's light enough um, that uh, as a neck knife, it really works. Light and, you know, it's not thin. It's not thin, but under a, you know, on top of a t-shirt, I should say, this was not against my skin on top of a t-shirt, but under a collared shirt, uh, this thing worked great. And, uh, I discovered that it's really, okay. So the first time I wore this out, we went to the diner, uh, one of our favorite little places to eat. We went to the diner that night. I had this under my shirt and right around, uh, hanging right around my, um, what do you call this part? The uh, solar plexus. And I figured that would be a great place to have a knife because if I'm sitting here eating and uh, my arms are on the table, they shouldn't be, but okay, say my, say my hands are on the table like this. And then someone comes in and I need to get a knife, but I can't be seen reaching for my pocket. It's right there. I could just, just slip my hand in there and grab. So this is the kind of thing I think of. Of course, this is not a this is not a real scenario. This isn't kind of thing that's happened to me before. I'm like, oh, I better remember next time. It's just the kind of imagination. 
I have. So, uh, but in any case, made me feel secure and it was light there and it was not a bother at all to have this uh, very effective three inch uh, triangular hole maker hanging around my neck. Really, really awesome. Okay, uh, next up, another one that I just showed off, uh, but I will, uh, I'll just show it again just for completeness of this list is the uh, Express, the Lacey Zabo Express. Um, you know, like I said, holding it like this, you can see it's not exactly a dagger. It's more of a fighter uh, with the top bevel being slightly smaller than the lower. And then with a with technically a bayonet grind because the, the grinds don't terminate at the same. The plunge grinds aren't uh, parallel. But that's just getting nerdy, really, isn't it? This is just sort of a modernized dagger with an asymmetrical handle and a and a modified, it's a modified dagger. That's all you got to do is say modified uh, with anything in the knife world. Modified dagger. Love this thing. Lacey Zabo, uh, I'm coming for you. I want to talk to you on the show. All right, next up is one that gets a lot of attention. I pull this out and people are like, oh, oh, I didn't know. Uh, this is the Spartan Harzi dagger. And it's wearing my favorite of the sheath options. This is the Chattanooga leather Um Chattanooga leather sheath for the Spartan Harzi um, dagger. Now, interesting thing about uh, Chattanooga leather, they are owned by RMJ, who also owns American Tomahawk. So RMJ, the uh, the the Tomahawk specialists, uh, mad scientists over there, also uh, bought up American Tomahawk, and they also own Chattanooga Leatherworks. So such a cool triumvirate. I love it. And I think Chattanooga Leatherworks makes the best leather sheaths. I love them. Uh, so I'm going to take it out of this. It has the Spartan hoplite helmet with the crossed arrows and the sword. Very cool. But here's the dagger. Just outstandingly gorgeous. Uh, based, uh, you can see a lot of influence uh, from the, um, uh, the Fairbairn Sykes here. If you look closely here, you'll see the hoplite helmet. And then right to the right of it, that's the Spartan logo. And then to the right of it is the um, big giant evergreen tree logo uh, for Bill Harzi. Bill Harzi grew up in the Pacific Northwest in a logging family. So uh, a sturdy stock and a uh, knife designer to special forces and um, green berets. And he's had his designs made by everyone from Chris Reeve to um, Spartan to Gerber to... Uh, you name it. Uh, he's he's had it made. Uh, uh, Lone Wolf. Remember Lone Wolf knives? Uh, I think they were bought up by ZT or something. Who bought up Lone Wolf? Oh, oh, uh, Benchmade, I think, bought Lone Wolf and then suffocated it in its bed. But uh, it was a they he did some beautiful designs for them. Um, but this dagger, look at this. This is more a, a thrusting implement. Yes, it does have hollow ground bevels, but those bevels are only about a half inch. So they are, or maybe even less. So you will be able to slash and those edges are sharp, but you don't have the belly you have on uh, some of the cold steel daggers. Um, and uh, so mad thrusting, great. You have a great uh, pommel here, or not pommel, guard. I love the forward facing quillions. Uh, you, you know, it doesn't matter the orientation of this knife. Um, you have it here, you have it here. It doesn't matter, it's symmetrical. Uh, including the the quillions, and I love that. Some people like to push up against the back. Um, I just like knowing they're there, <laughs> you know. And and you know, I don't use this knife, so I'm not exactly sure how I would, uh, in a pinch, grab this thing. But uh, you know, it, it would be pretty intuitive. Beautiful knife. This also has a um, noggin nocter attitude adjuster. Uh, so this is the tang protruding from the. Uh, fully sandwiched G10. So this G10 handle fully sandwiches the tang. So you take that off, take off both handle scales, and there's a groove, you know, a channel cut in there, and the tang fits in there. This is really a fine, fine, fine knife. Uh, I got this for a really good deal from someone who took great care of it. And uh, a very, very good one of the best second secondary market purchases I ever made. I would keep your eye out for it. Uh, it is expensive. It's like a $400 knife new. I did not pay that, but uh, it is worth it. If, well, I don't know, depending on your value system, I'd say it's worth it. <laughs> uh, I like Bill Harzi. And this is the 
pinnacle of his design, I think. All right, next up is one of those knives from Cold Steel. There's a lot of Cold Steel on this list, four, I think. But this one is even more so than the Taipan is a slashy dagger. Uh, this is the um, Safekeeper, no, Peacekeeper 2. Uh, meaning it's the smaller of the two peacekeepers. This is a discontinued knife. This was also a um, secondary market purchase uh, within the last four or five months. And if you can see this, you'll see that towards the tip, the uh, belly really widens out. Uh, okay, so it's it's pretty thin down by the Ricasso. Uh, the hollow ground bevels widen out uh, about two thirds of the way down and, and uh, sort of crest and then come back in for a, a less uh, pokey point. But that less pokey point is incredibly pokey. It, it, it's, uh, you know, coming to a razor sharp diamond tip. So though it doesn't look as um, uh, acutely tipped, say, as this Spartan Harzi, it still penetrates in, insanely uh, with very, very little um, effort. And that is because it's not relying necessarily on the point. It's relying on the converge convergence of four very sharp edges. Um, and here you're looking at a needle tip. Both great, both effective. Uh, I'll take them both. Uh, but really you get a lot of uh, slashing and cutting capability with this one. Uh, the handle is a little crowded on this smaller version, uh, but I have learned that <clears throat> sort of like some of the smaller knives uh, in saber grip, this works best when you kind of cheat down a little bit and, and put the pommel in your palm against your palm. And then you can, you can exert a lot of force that way in reverse grip. It's perfection. It is absolute perfection. You have nothing really extra in terms of pommel, uh, if you're in some sort of duel with a very sophisticated Kali fighter uh, and you have too much pommel or too much puño, they can disarm you in, in a theoretical, super sophisticated Kali knife fight. OK, um, but here you don't run that risk. It's a small enough handle and you cap that thumb or uh, cap the uh, pommel with the thumb and uh, it's going to stay there all day. Very comfortable. You've got a Coke bottle in in both directions you get that with almost all of these uh, except for the tops pretty much you get a contoured coke bottle style handle um on these daggers yeah really the only one without it is is uh the sting because it's just a piece of metal and the tops because it's just flat uh scales so that is the peacekeeper two or safekeeper two see i can't ever keep wait which one is that that is the peacekeeper two Safekeeper 2 is coming up. Can't ever keep those keepers straight. All right, next is another very, 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 very prized one. This is a classic Randall made uh, model number 2-7. 7 standing for blade length. Uh, length. And so this is the 7-inch. Look at that. First of all, it just comes in a beautiful package. That beautifully stitched, um, thick leather sheath is just so appealing to me you've got a sharpening stone in there i believe that's an arkansas stone and uh i got the stacked leather handles this is the commando style handle i didn't have to wait five years for either of my randall knives all i had to do was be lucky and find them on knife center knife center uh sells very limited quantities of randall knives and lucky for me the two that I got from them were basically the exact knives from Randall Knives I wanted. And now, of course, I want many others. But these were the two prerequisites. And this chief among both of them, the combat stiletto. Mm -mm -mm. Now, this might, have, this might be the first one, the first dagger uh, in this sort of modern lineup that, that had those uh, big... Uh, what do you call them? Edges, big bellied edges for slashing. This one would be fantastic for that. Uh, it also is hollow ground, comes to a thin, is it, is it? Yeah, it's very, very subtly hollow ground, must be done on a very big wheel, but you can kind of tell it is. Uh, you've got a very uh, stout, sturdy, stiff blade. I mean, look at this full thickness of the blade comes up at least halfway, and then it distal tapers from 
no, about two thirds of the way up the blade. And then it distal tapers from there in that last third. So it's still a very stout tip, uh, but not needle like. So, you know, we'll be able to stand up to some abuse. The Randall made knives were um, big in World War II, used a lot in World War II and in Vietnam. Uh, but World War II is where they really uh, first came came out and shown. And uh, so looking at this dagger, you can sort of see that it is meant for, you know, some some I don't want to say hard use with that with that dagger. Most daggers aren't put to hard use, but it's meant to go through a lot. Uh, both literally and physically, or, or uh, literally and figuratively. Oh, uh, man, the stacked leather, though, just gets me every time. Just a beautiful shape, and I love the pommel. Every This is a collector's piece, obviously. All of these are because I don't use daggers, um, thankfully. So they're all collector's pieces, but this one is one that um, is for the ages, definitely, with its lineage and such. Okay, the next cold steel keeper is the safe keeper, too. And this one is a push dagger. And I have just come to the conclusion that I do not have enough push daggers in my life. This is the only one, shocking as that may sound, the only push dagger I have. I've had some of the little ones and I've given them away, but uh, I think I need a custom here. But anyway, let's talk about this one. This I've had for quite a long time. It's an old school uh, Kydex cold steel sheath, flat on the one side, somewhat contoured on the other, uh, so it sits up against your body well. Uh, it has the integrated clip and great retention. This was the first Kydex that replaced the leather for this. Just another beautiful uh, hollow ground, slashy, bellied dagger in a push dagger package here. How big is this? One, two, it's a three and wait, let's see. Yeah, three and a three and three quarters inch blade. Um, very comfortable contoured craton handle, and really just uh, you know, just a force to reckon with. This is would be very, very difficult to disarm. Basically, you'd have to make someone open their hand and let go of it to disarm it. And there are ways to do that, I'm sure. Uh, but just a very hard knife to, to just grab out of someone's hand because there's nothing to grab. Um, the, only, the only stuff to grab is going gonna, is gonna to do you harm. And I think it's unrealistic to think you could pry, come under here and pry, especially if the individual has bigger hands than I do. And most, you know, many might. All right, so that's the safekeeper too. It's a push dagger, uh, something that I... I uh, I need more of. I like the supposed past. I like the idea of these being something that riverboat gamblers would keep in their, you know, in their belt to take out in case there's uh, some sort of disagreement over the card game or whatever. You know, you produce that little little push dagger and and go to town. Okay, uh, la uh, second to last, uh, we're gonna dip into history here. Uh, one one of them that is the most iconic of all time, the Fairbairn Sykes. Uh, my brother got me this example. It's got a slightly bent blade, which I, I remember reading uh, was a thing that would happen. Um, very, This one is very sharp. There, It's four zero ground bevels, edges here. Um, I don't remember... This is one that I've done a little bit of research on, and uh, you can see from the uh, some of the seaming work here, this was done in somewhat of a rush. This was not a, a knife that was labored over um, in, in great detail, uh, but was very effective. Uh, this one in particular, I know it had a number of different... Uh, uh, here's... This means something right here on the, this engraving on the pommel. Uh, a number of different companies were licensed to make this knife. It did, and it had a couple of different design uh, evolutions. And then just due to the fact that it was not a great knife for flexing into uh, utility, uh, they, they, they ended up phasing them out, as they did with this next knife I'm going to show you. But here you go with the, with the all... Uh, all aspects of uh, wasp wasting or coke bottling of that handle. So you get that that thing. You've got a heavier pommel here, which makes the the blade itself 
so lively and uh, it makes it move uh, in a way that reminds me a little bit of a sword, how a sword has the weighted pommel. And so the tip can can be put to put where it needs to be put very, very easily um, because you have that counterweight in the back. Uh, this is one of the knives that hangs behind me. Um, one of the great, uh, my, my brother has uh, some, co collects uh, firearms from this era or has a few, I guess I should say, from this era and, and has, some, has some guys and he's been able to get some really great knives for me. Uh, one of them is also a uh, K-bar hanging on the wall from Korea or World War II. I haven't been able to figure that out. Okay, last up here is my most impressive dagger and and by far um, one of my lifetime's grail knives. Um, and my brother Vic got this for me last year and uh, phew, such a cool gift because I know he wanted to keep this himself. This is the U.S. Uh, 1918 trench knife. Uh, it's got these nasty cast bronze knuckles and and a dagger blade. The dagger blade is 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 serviceable right now, um, but it's not razor sharp. I am not going to make it razor sharp. Uh, but this knife, as you can imagine, has been, I don't know, it's just been one I've wanted forever. And to have it is a real... It, it is a real grail achieved, so uh, thanks to my brother for that. But you've got this big, heavy knuckle dusters with the points. Not all of them had the points. Uh, and then you have that giant uh, bolt, not bolt, uh, nut on the end that comes to that steep point. Every Everything about this is meant to cause damage. Any way you, any way you apply it, you got stabbing, you got slashing, you've got uh, punching, and uh, tenderizing here you've got the skull crusher and look at all the hand protection you have from this from this guard that's almost sword like um, and then you have that forward facing quillion for uh, additional force with the thumb if need be what's kind of interesting to me about this is that uh, i have a couple of other knuckle dusters modern day this and uh this is from uh, mcnee's knives and i have the uh these station nine knives and the knuckles I've tried modern day knuckles are bigger. They're, too, they're big for my hand. And I think that's because, uh, you know, back in world war one, world war two, when this thing was around, um, people were smaller. There wasn't so much bovine growth hormone in all the meat and milk. Uh, so people are seem to be bigger now so that the hands are bigger. The knuckle dusters are bigger, but this one from back in 1918 fits my hand perfectly. So I think, I think uh, maybe uh, maybe men were more of my stature back in the day. I mean, I'm I'm six foot. It's not like I'm short, or not like I'm of, of small stature, but I'm not a big meat meat hook kind of guy. Um, so someone with giant hands might have a, an issue with this knife. I'm I'm just not sure. Um, but the way these uh, knuckle holes, the way these finger holes are designed is really ingenious. First of all, it gives you a deeper choil here for the finger, for the forefinger, uh, which puts the knife in a slightly downward uh, canting, which gives you a little more force behind that uh, cutting, main cutting edge, forward cutting edge. But then it gives you um, these tall knuckles. So maybe you have gloves or, you know, gives you some room to accommodate uh, something you might have on your hand, but they come out in a fanning, um, in a fanning shape, just like our 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 finger bones, whatever these are called, metatarsal, they're all anchored down here, and then they splay outward. Well, you can see how that continues uh, in the ergonomics of this knuckle duster. And you you might say, Bob, they all do that, but I don't I I don't think they do. The two that I just show you do, but uh, anyway, I just think it feels really comfortable in hand, and I could see um, how what a devastating weapon this is but they needed a devastating knife that could also open up crates and do other things so this one also uh, went the way of the uh, of the dodo bird after not too long uh, in deference next to the m3 trench knife uh, with the stacked leather handle and the bayonet double-edged uh, ground blade and then eventually the k-bar um, 
but man, what a what an awesome knife this is, and what a what a great way to wrap up, if I do say so myself, uh, this this cavalcade of awesome daggers. Uh, do you like daggers? Let me know in the comments below which are your favorite daggers. Uh, do you lament the fact that I got rid of my Tops Rangers Edge dagger the way I do? Probably you do. Uh, be sure to join us on Sunday for a great interview with uh, a, a knife luminary and then join us on Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. You can also download this podcast to your favorite podcast app and listen. And who knows, you might be listening right now. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast